Okay, welcome back, everybody. Um, I want to introduce the panel for our leadership uh, roundtable, CEO roundtable, um, and this will be moderated by, by Jill, who's done a wonderful job emceeing today. Um, the three panels we have truly bring a huge amount of um, experience and knowledge about social media and financial services. Um, John Taft is on our panel. He's the CEO of RBC Wealth Management, and he's responsible for their uh, wealth management growth strategy and was previously chairman of the Securities Industry and Financial Markets Association. He's also a LinkedIn influencer, and he's, uh, he's a published author. And uh, this was on his LinkedIn profile. He's a direct descendant from William Howard Taft, the president. So if, you've, if you recognize the last name. Um, the second person on the panel is uh, Clara, Sh Clara Shi. She is um, not only on the board of Starbucks, which gets my share of wallet, but also the CEO and co-founder of um, Hearsay, which is a financial services social media software company. Um, she's also been named one of Fortune's most powerful women entrepreneurs and on Fast Company's most influential um, people in technology. And then finally, um, I'll introduce you to um, Audrey Hendley. Audrey is the uh, senior VP and GM for prospect engagement and new member acquisition at American Express. And she uh, has a very, very deep knowledge of small businesses and what they're looking for, particularly online, but just in general from financial services companies. So without further ado, um, uh, please welcome our panelists. All right, the intrepid participants who have stuck <laughs> around. Get ready for the ice storm. OK, um, so let's start off um, with just a kind of a general um, overview of where you think financial services is um, sort of five years hence and um, are we are we all are we better are we better Clara is it things all set we're done everything good well there's perception there's reality and there's different sectors I mean certainly from the Silicon Valley perspective financial services is, is alive and well venture capital private equity never been higher volume amounts um, we, we at Hearsay raised our Series C last, last fall with, with no trouble. Um, but I think overall, you know, I think that there's still cautious optimism. And as we heard throughout the day from Mohammed and others, you know, there's, there's still a lot of, of catch up we need to do for some of the mistakes made in the past. So I'd say that you know, we are back to closer to being on the right track, but there's still more work to do. From a marketing perspective, there's been a lot of trust lost as a result of these actions. And I guess that's why we're all here, is to, to look at social and digital and see how we can regain that consumer confidence and trust in the industry. Now, John, uh, you and I are, I think, a little bit closer in age than I am with Clara. We've seen <laughs> boom and bust cycles before. Is that uh, a trick statement? No. Nope. Not. I, mm -mm. That's my lessons from the home front would tell me neither to confirm or deny that. Let's just that. say that we. I know you, so uh, okay. we've seen we've seen some of the gyrations, and you've seen good times and bad times. How has this last round been different from the other busts that you've seen? Oh, I wanted to answer the question you asked, Clara, but I will say this, and. Um, you have to keep this last financial crisis in perspective. Um, on the scale of bad things that have happened to the financial system and through the financial system to society, if you think of, um, I don't know, seismic events, one to 10, this last financial crisis was a three and a half. You weren't burying your mother's silverware in the backyard. Uh, animals weren't being shot on the streets to uh, uh, provide food. I mean, there have been, even in our lifetimes, uh, social and financial system disruptions that are far worse than this, and yet, you know, we're acting like it's the end of the world. It wasn't the end of the world, uh, but it certainly took us to the beginning of the end of the world and let us look over the edge at what it could look like and feel like if we don't get our act together. So that's what I think happened. And, and the obligation we all have right now is to learn from and act on the lessons we should have learned from this, in the long run, relatively benign look at what systemic disruption could mean for modern society. Wow. 
Do you want to answer Clara's question also? Later, I'll All come right. back. I'm kind of done. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm like, you. Yeah, I need a cigarette after that. <laughs> First of all, I'm like, it's a three and a half. I don't want to know what a five feels like, because that felt pretty bad to me. Um, <laughs> What's that, commodities? <laughs> exactly. Uh, I was teaching, while we were waiting in the wings, I was teaching them commodities hand signals so we could you know, do fun things. Um, Audrey, I mean, Amex is a little bit different, because um, I'm wondering, in, as a company, did you feel the extent of the crisis as distinctly as a company that was more of a uh, sort of directly connected to the banking sector? Well, we certainly don't sell mortgages. Right. Which certainly is a, on the right-hand side as opposed to the left-hand side. But we certainly sell plenty of credit products. Um, we, unfortunately or fortunately, and I don't want to be disparaging to members of the audience, American Express likes to think of ourselves as probably the non-bank bank a little right. bit. Right. Um, because of... Um, just our heritage and the products that we offer and the space that we play in in terms of um, the travel part of our business as well as many of the other lines of business we have. Um, but we certainly felt the pain like many of the people in the room. Um, I think for American Express where we focused a lot on is just making sure that we are very focused on delivering on the customer experience and the customer products. And that was before the crisis and even more so after mm. the crisis. John. Um when you look at the financial services as a percentage of the overall economy, it's still probably shrinking a bit and continues to shrink. Um, how, as a leader in an organization, with if you have an industry that's shrinking, how do you have a how do you have a perspective on growth? What is what is the way that you kind of infuse the people that you work with with saying, like, "Hey, we can grow if the sector itself is shrinking"? Right. Um, first of all, the shrinkage which is a real phenomenon, uh, revenues from financial sector activities as a percentage of GDP is down significantly from the pre-crisis peak. But that's a good thing. Because uh, what happened in the years leading up to the crisis is that that percentage of revenues from the financial sector grew dramatically compared to historical averages. And the reason it grew dramatically was all the activities that fueled the financial crisis, i.e. the leveraging up of financial services organizations, which artificially inflated the importance of the sector relative to its impact in the real economy. So the fact that we're back down now, closer to historical averages, is actually a healthy sign, sign that, the, that, that we're healing from the crisis. But within that larger number, the, the sectors that are shrinking are those business activities where large amounts of capital are required to underpin um, the activity. So uh, finance uh, or uh, um, currency and fixed income trading, FIC activities, way down. Proprietary trading, which is also down because Volcker won't permit it. Um, the business, the sectors in the industry that are growing are the sectors where lots of flow business is generated without a lot of capital required to underpin it. What are those businesses? Investment banking, wealth management, and asset management. So this is going on inside the industry. Also healthy because investment banking, asset management, wealth management are businesses that are innately more client focused mm. than the prop trading mm. and uh, balance sheet trading activities that were in the ascendancy pre-crisis. Not that having to deal with clients every day is a guarantee against unethical behavior, but if you need to wake up in the morning and talk to real people using your services to do real things in real markets in the real world, you are a whole lot more likely to behave the way we should behave in the industry. So I think all of this is positive. 
And I forgot what your original question was. I just used it <laughs> as an occasion to pontificate, exactly. for which I Excellent. apologize. It was really well done. Right. Um, you did, I said, in a, in a contracting industry, how do you have, what kind of vision of growth? And what you're saying is these three areas are growth areas, right? Investment right. management, and asset management, and wealth management. That's healthy. And that's a good thing. Right. All right. So Thank yeah, I got you really focused. Thank you for reminding me what the <laughs> point of my. Um, so Clara, you've got a foot in Silicon Valley and you've a foot in financial services. And um, so how is that how is that transition for you and how is that life? How is that that split bipolar life, East Coast, West Coast, what's it like for you? So it's You're bipolar? I, I am. Okay. Yeah, I'll talk about it later. All right. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually before I answer that question, I have one more thought about the, the shrinking sector. Mm -hmm. I mean a lot of people would have thought in the early eighties that coffee was a shrinking sector. And in the earlier panels, they talked about the importance of this industry to move from a transactional one of highly commoditized goods and services to one where you're really focused on service and on the customer experience. And I mean, it, digital, social, certainly that's a part of it, but it's really end to end. It's how people feel when they come into your branch. It's how they feel when they meet with your bankers and with your advisors. And so I'd say that's another way is to, to take something that's, that's commoditized and that's almost written off as low margin and really turn that on its head. Um, so now to your, to your question about Silicon Valley in New York. You know, I'm, I think you're asking me this because as we were standing outside, mm. I was telling uh, these guys that I, I have a New York part of my wardrobe and I've got my Silicon Valley part I of my I just wardrobe. wanted to hear what the difference was. Because <laughs> you know, I, there are certain things, like if I wore you know, a suit to our office in, in San Francisco, my employees would think that I was crazy. And yet here in New York, we, we do a lot of business with you all at banks and insurance companies. And so it's just it's a different culture and, and attire is just one aspect of that. So um, in, in thinking about that, I mean, you come from this you know, sort of creative culture and you move into financial services, is it hard to kind of tap into the creative culture in a business like financial services? It is and it isn't. It's been a fascinating journey over the last four years for, for my team to get up to speed on the realities. I mean, financial services is complex, but it plays such a crucial role in society. And for us to understand all those different various lines of business and how they interact, and it's almost like a fun problem solving challenge mm -hmm. where we've got these ideas, the people who, all of you who work at these institutions have those ideas and we partner together and we say, how do we figure this out in a way that's still FINRA and SEC and IROC compliant? Uh, Audrey, I'm looking, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to interview Ed Gilligan last year at this conference and I know that he's really into this idea of just breaking it down and saying, let's do something new, let's innovate, let's try that. And I'm just wondering that coming out of the financial crisis, how hard it has been to innovate into this type, into a sort of a sour mood of a consumer. Well, I even take it a step further before the financial crisis. American Express is a company that stood the test of probably 160 odd years of history. So it certainly, had its moments and I think when we go back and you look at the amount of companies that are still standing after 160 years, you could probably count them mm -hmm. on one hand. Mm -hmm. But the reason American Express has been successful is because we have inspiring leaders like Ed that you just spoke about, but across the organization who get up trying to think about how to win the hearts and minds of our customers. Wow. And uh, we recently, just this week, had a town hall with our CEO. And uh, of course, our stock price has been, has had phenomenal performance in the last uh, 12 months. And um, he said, I don't focus on stock price. I focus on what value I'm delivering to my customers and you need to do the same thing mm -hmm. and the rest will follow. So when you ask about Ed, he's really living the values of American Express saying, you know, get out there, innovate. <coughs> you know, you need to take some of your marketing budget, set it aside, experiment because something will come off that and it's okay if it doesn't work. And he really wants to hear about what doesn't work. Mm. And we talk about that a lot. If I could Go. pick up on that, there's a, if you haven't read it, read it. Uh, it's a book written, most recent book, written by Robert Schiller, K. Schiller Index, Nobel Laureate, Yale professor. And it's called Finance uh, and the Good Society. So the case he makes in that book is for innovation. So post-financial crisis, you're absolutely right, by the way, innovation is a dirty word because it was the innovations 
inappropriately applied uh, that led to a lot of the excesses. But his point is really that innovation is exactly what you want from financial services, which by the way, I personally think is one of the most creative industries one could possibly uh, be part of. But innovation, the right kind of innovation, so in his case, he's talking at a macro level, innovation in the service of helping society achieve its goals. The same thing applies, though, to what you just said, innovation, the right kind of innovation, innovation in the service of individual clients, helping them achieve their, on a micro level, their goals. Their goals. That's the right kind of innovation. Innovation for the sake of, you know, uh, well, uh, fin driving financial results with no societally beneficial purpose to the innovation is exactly what gets you in trouble. And how do you foster that in your company? What are you telling your people and what are you investing in to innovate on the ground? Well, you know, my whole shtick is <laughs> that you need as, as leaders of industry and as managers in business, you have to continually keep in mind and connect with the mission and the purpose of your organization. And that mission and that purpose better be about helping real people in the real world and real markets solve real problems, achieve real goals. So if you go back every day and connect with that and talk about it, then that will drive a culture of you know, focusing on the clients. And, and we are about, the financial services industry is about, I can't speak to other industries because quite frankly I haven't worked in them, is about, is about our clients, it's about our customers. It's even about our counterparties sort of in declining order of obligation to them. So stay focused on the people you're supposed to be serving and that will drive everything else. So I absolutely agree with what you're talking about. One other point, just another book, in case you're in the book business. Um, you seem to be. Well, I, <laughs> I, I, am, in the, I am in the book business, as it turns out. I, I actually am. Um, Will you blurb my book when I write it? I would oh, be honored. Are you kidding me? He's gonna, it happened here. About your book. <laughs> yeah. Your um, witnesses. Roger Martin, Fixing the Game. What was the season? Any sports fans, uh, uh, football fans, the year the uh, New England Patriots went undefeated in the regular season? Anybody know what year that was? 97? 97? 96? 2007. Undefeated during the regular season. So in the real market of NFL football, they were perfect. You know how many times that season they beat the point spread? Three times. Mm. Every other time, they failed to beat the point spread. If you'd bet on them, took the spread, you would have lost. So there was an example of the Boston New England Patriots excelling in the real market of NFL football and failing in the expectations market. This is helping real people. This is worrying about your stock price. And if I just may be a New Yorker for a second, I think that was still when they were cheating and they haven't won a Super Bowl since. So I'm just saying. Um, uh, how, to Audrey, under, how to undermine your brand, right? Yeah, no there kidding. There you were, undefeated but cheating. Exactly. Kind of, yeah. um, Audrey, I want to shift gears a little bit. You know, a, a company like American Express is sitting on just mounds of big data. And I'm just wondering, um, how do you harness that and pull it together and give something of value to your customer as a result of having all that information? Um, I think the key word I'm gonna focus on in your question is how. And I'll give you an example. Um, so I work in the new customer acquisition business, which many of you may do too. And uh, we try to understand how do customers make decisions? And What's going on for them when they, on the day of the moment of truth when they, try, when they actually go and purchase that decision? So um, we know that customers probably don't wake up this morning and say, I really got to get a, ca a card from American Express Open. So I spend a lot of time trying to figure out 
how, what are they thinking about and how are they thinking? We recently did uh, some market research, which we do very frequently, uh, but this was very different. We harnessed um, 16 months of uh, social data. Uh, we looked at uh, 40 million conversations. Mm. We harnessed it down to 47,000 that we were very interested in. And it was really about understanding the adjacencies to the purchase path. So hopefully that answers the question of how, and just with one simple example of the depth and fortitude and, and look and fortune I have as a marketer to have that at my disposal. And that goes on across our company. But you get that information and you distill it down to those 47,000 interesting conversations. What's the response? What are you put it, putting back out to that, those folks? What we put back out is the insight from that information. So what, um, instead of possibly talking about credit cards, maybe you talk about cash flow. Uh, instead of using the words that we are so used to using inside our company, we use, uh, or we attempt to use, uh, better customer facing vernacular. And it sounds very easy to do. On the last panel, they were talking a lot about you know, the challenges of working in compliance and the legal environment. And it, they are real challenges. But as you actually try to talk in customer's language, which goes back to some of our earlier conversations on this panel around transparency and coming out of the financial crisis, it actually is quite easy. But you have to really understand what the prospect and what the customers want and what they're saying. And that drives how you execute marketing, where you are, you need to be where prospects are, as opposed to thinking that they're going to come to you. And I think that mm. that's like, it's a really different shift in how things get done now than even through two or three years ago. And, and I presume that, you know, that, that having that conversation via social is what's, you know, because there is that two-way conversation. And so, Clara, I'm wondering, from your perspective as, uh, you know, the person who sort of can walk into a financial services organization and say, let me explain to you how powerful this tool can be, what is the misconception that you are most often confronted with when you go in with your Yahoo social? Like, what is it that's coming back at you that you're like, oh, not this again? There's so many. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's getting better, though. It's changed over time. I think three or four, three, four years ago when we started, the misconception or the non-starter was, was really compliance. It's mm -hmm. like, there's no way we can do it. We can't move forward. And it was really, you know, it's, it's an industry that was in defensive mode instead of thinking offensively and what can we do proactively. Uh, but then we figured it out. And turns out compliance is, it's difficult, it's messy, it's ugly, but it's not rocket science. It's, it's really just a checklist of things that you need to be able to do. And lucky for all of us, you can automate a lot of that through technology or streamline the workflow around it. I think now it's uh, grappling with uh, with all the different ways you can use social media sites. I mean, you, you're, you're talking about it at the company level. You could do it at the business line level. You have different brands within your company. And then you've got your relationship managers out there. And many of you in the room have, you know, it's, it's not just the advisors. It's also the investment bankers. It's also the retirement consultants. It's always also the asset managers. There's all kinds of different groups and use cases and rules that each of them has to abide by. And I remember um, when John and I were talking a couple of weeks ago, he had said to me, uh, regulators aren't doing enough to keep up with social, but you actually are having conversations with regulators as well. And so what do they want to know from you? I think they just want to understand these technologies. I mean, regulators, And they don't really know. Well, some of them do. It's scary. <laughs> <laughs> regulators are, are good people, but they're busy. And it's hard enough for all of us to keep up with, with the tremendous innovation that we get from companies like LinkedIn. And so they're trying to make sense of it too. And what they've come to recognize, I think, in the last few years is that, that social media is inherently different. It's not just the same old advertising rules that we've always had. It's interactive, it's real time, it's social. And so they're, they're adapting the, the rules. And what's interesting to me is, John, you embraced social very early on. And you know, as you can tell within three minutes of talking to John, he is very authentic and he likes to have a conversation about <laughs> real things. So I'm just wondering, whether you think that this is, I mean, you're a leader of an organization. Is this something that every leader has to embrace? Uh, to be honest with you, I, I didn't come to this early. I came to it late. Um, actually, Clara and, and Kristen were, were helpful in, in positioning me. And my PR firm 
uh, got me set up with LinkedIn because I was on Bloomberg surveillance with uh, Dan Roth one day, and he announced on air that I was their latest LinkedIn influencer. And I didn't know what that was, but I, I acted, <laughs> but you know, I I acted like I was really excited about it. <laughs> and, 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 um, like I won something. But, but, okay, so for my demographic, which is <laughs> a little, little be further along the, chronologically than yours, Jill, is um, this is all new stuff, and I'm still, I personally am still trying, and I know a lot of the people who work for me are still trying to understand what it is and what it isn't, and how to use it, and how to, um, how to, how it can change, how it can help the business. What's noise, and what's a real potential driver of either incremental or transformational change? And we all know there's something there. We just, we just don't quite know what it is. So I would say what, what every CEO or every executive should be doing is learning by trying it, testing it, mm -hmm. getting out there, seeing what happens, because. It, I, I just find it experientially, it's a completely different world. Um, and some things are valuable and some things are a waste of time. And what, what do people like to consume online and what do they like to get other ways? To me, I'm still learning and the, the jury's still out as to how um, social media is A, going to, well, is going to affect my business, the wealth management business. I know it will. I don't know how, I don't know to what degree, but I know I better be you know, at the forefront of figuring that out. Right, well, and John brings up a good point because let's face it, most of the CEOs in the industry we work with are not as eloquent, are not as, as well versed okay, in, okay, in okay. sharing. No, it's true. <laughs> and they, they, they probably will not blog on a regular basis, but we still encourage them to sign up for accounts even use, you know, just, just to see what's out there. And because if that's how their employees and their customers are experiencing the world, that's something that they need to have firsthand knowledge and understanding of. So Audrey, how has the advent of social and two-way communication, you talked a little bit about how it's providing you with information, but you're doing a lot of direct output geared towards your Amex customers as well as merchants. So how has that really changed? It must have been pretty dramatic over the last couple of years. Um, tremendously dramatic. Um, in fact, many members of our social team are here, so I speak on their behalf, not necessarily on what I've done. Um, we, in the Thanksgiving weekend, um, are the founding members of Small Business Saturday. And Small Business Saturday is certainly well funded by American Express, but at its essence, it's about helping our merchants and our customers to do more business. And uh, you talked about your vision has to connect to your customer, customers. Mm -hmm. And um, our vision is to help businesses do more business. So uh, Small Business Saturday was born out of that vision. And um, we <coughs> wanted to get customers to really own what Small Business Saturday was all about. And if we wanted them to own it, it wasn't about us saying it. They needed to say it to each other. Mm -hmm. So social has helped us to do that um, with all kinds of great success. For example, I think uh, last year we got uh, over uh, 3 million likes on Facebook for Small Business Saturday, and nearly a million hashtag tweets, hmm. um, and a phenomenal amount of content and good content pushed out by us but it took on a virality that we certainly couldn't have anticipated. So it, we set the tone, we set the message, we certainly uh, set up a lot of marketing content that can be distributed by the merchants or by the customers or by the influencers, um, but it takes on a life of its own. So we have to set the tone at the top and hopefully it takes place in the marketplace. John, are there certain, I mean, you like to talk about pretty much anything. Are there certain <laughs> topics that you actually want to shy away from as the CEO of a big wealth management firm? Um, well, I actually, um, yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and whether I want to shy away from them, my compliance uh, and um, uh, business partners want me to stay away from them. Um, and I think, uh, so, but I would say, uh, you know, to the extent I, you know, extent you're constructive in your in whatever it is you're saying, and you're you're trying to help somebody out by saying it, or 
make a difference by saying it. Then, then you're going to stay in a spot that nobody's going to criticize you for. Um, throwing stones and uh, talking meanly about people or self-promotion, that, that doesn't work. But I'm, I'm going to go back to your whole issue of authenticity. Jill and I got off on this. I don't know how. There was an essay written back when I was in college by Lionel Trilling called Sincerity and Authenticity. And those were defined terms. It was an essay at lecture at Harvard. The, you know, authenticity is communicating in a way that is um, true to who you are and what you feel and, and putting it out there. And the more intimate the setting you're in, you know, one on one in a you know in a room like this obviously isn't intimate, but it's face to face. The the more authenticity comes <coughs> through non-verbally, right? So that so the better off you are. And then you can you can actually get there on television because people can watch you. Being authentic in a social media constant uh, construct is, I think, very difficult because it's. Um, <coughs> It's a different kind of intimacy, and so I've been trying to experiment with how do you, how do you communicate authenticity, which people relate to. I mean, at least my experience is mm -hmm. they relate to it. If you can be authentic, you can differentiate yourself. People will remember you. People will trust you. Trust is huge in our industry. But how do you be authentic through is communicating through social media channels? Um, I'm, I think that could be a, a, an important skill, broadly speaking, and I'm trying to figure out what that, what that looks like. Um, being interesting is, is part of it, and being intelligent or trying to be is part of it. Being interesting means being edgy without being over the line controversial, taking on a tough subject and bringing to bear on it a fresh perspective that enlightens and educates people who are reading or, or, or digesting your content, that's, I guess, the closest I've come to an amateur's formula for authenticity online. But you know, it's interesting because going back to what you said earlier, you know, you sat there talking about the financial services industry and saying like, hey, we have to do something that's of value and we can't just be creating these complex derivative products. That in and itself is an authentic statement that I think that most consumers would say like, yeah, thank God, there's not some dude up there saying, we just did it because we needed liquidity in the market. Like there's plenty of liquidity in the market. We kind of all get that. Or we did it because we wanted to make money. Right. And, that kind of thing. and you're willing to, so saying something like that, it, does that make you a pariah with other folks in your industry? <laughs> no, 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 it doesn't. Um, actually, it was one of those, um, periods where mo most people in the industry I know acknowledge what happened. Not on the air, not on the record. Oh, maybe not on the record. Because um, I tried. <laughs> well, they're, you know, I, if I can't suffering do, I from do. media constipation. I mean, it's not <laughs> yeah. that hard. If you just, if you, you know, once you get into the mode of, of you know, speaking truth, people I mean, just just do it intelligently. I mean, don't. It's it's not that hard. To, you do it. You're on air all the time. It's not that hard to be um, interesting and creative and provocative without being uh, getting in trouble. It really isn't that hard. Well, I mean, and I and I think it's great. I mean, I think that's why we need more people who are really speaking their own truths within the context of what's legal and compliant. And I'm wondering, Clara, with you know you, the variety of clients you have that are not the Johns of the world who are comfortable in their own skin, how do you help them access that authenticity? So I, I have two thoughts on authenticity. I mean, one is when, it's different when you're a high profile person because it's, it's extra hard to be authentic on an interactive medium because people would expect you to respond to them. And if you've got thousands or millions of followers, you might not respond to them, that, that is less authentic. So that's, that's a thought. But from a, from a financial firm perspective, you know, one way to be authentic is to let your real people do the talking. Mm -hmm. Instead of your legal department, do the talking. And real people will need training, they'll need guidelines, they'll need to be compliant. But ultimately, it doesn't get more authentic than the man or woman who's on the ground 
giving that small business owner a loan or helping you buy your first home through that mortgage. And so that's been really powerful. Uh, and then beyond that, it's, it's just making sure that, you know, yes, we have to pre-approve a lot of this content from a compliance perspective, but it doesn't have to sound pre-approved. It doesn't have to sound completely like legalese. It can sound human and it can be funny. Uh, Audrey, tell me about how you're talking to small business owners who really do feel like they kind of got the short end of the stick in this whole recovery process, that they really have felt uh, sort of, well, you know, we bailed the big banks out, but my business suffered, and who is taking care of me? How have you responded to that and created a dialogue where you're building support for them? Well, let me talk about one particular segment that we're focusing a lot on. Um, there are 28 million small businesses in America. Eight million, of them, eight million of those businesses are owned by women. Of those eight million businesses, only 2% of the women-owned businesses get, get to be over $1 million in revenue. Hmm. Women start businesses at twice the rate of men. <laughs> so. That's a huge market opportunity, as you can imagine. And when you're in the businesses that we're all in, it's all about looking for segments and trying to understand where there are gaps in segments and where can you add some value mm -hmm. and build some brand trust and ultimately a relationship with a customer. So clearly we've defined this women's segment and I heard um, some other speakers say talking about that too. And we find places where other people are not and where there's a huge amount of need. Um, in the fall, we had a great program called a CEO Bootcamp where we bought, brought a lot of the female CEOs together with a lot of people who can help them to build their business, giving them real skills, real tips, workshops to help educate people on what does it mean to grow your business. It's beyond the passion you have for growing your business. There are other things you need to consider too. It was so successful that we have to sign up more programs. There's huge amount of demand. But we're really trying to figure out how can we make a difference in, for those prospects, for those customers, so that they can really you know, make a difference to their employees mm -hmm. and within their companies. And how are you pushing that message out? Are you using social to engage them to say, come to this boot camp, or are they cherry picked, or how, how are of you doing Of course, we believe we've got the best social program of all, which is Open Forum from American <laughs> Express. Ah, how shocking. <laughs> um, but it is a huge Scott. community. <laughs> a huge community built for and built with small business owners. And um, it's a community that brings small business owners together to get and give advice. And that was a huge place where we were able to get the word on a CEO Bootcamp out. But it's beyond being on our properties. We obviously push a lot of that content out to affiliate sites and other places where, you know, where our customers are so that they can you know, learn about what we do. I'm just, um, I'm, you know, it's, it's interesting because obviously American Express is a very different kind of company than RBC. And I'm wondering, John, if you think that social is a way, because it is a two-way conversation, not just a way to say, hey, I want to talk to you and let us manage your money, but for you to really kind of push out what the value system of your organization is, and how do you do that? Well, I don't know how we're going to end up using social media. There are people from RBC here from our from our marketing uh, department who are, are learning what you're doing, and then Clara is, is uh, going to help us do that. But um, here's, the, here's the, uh, the, the core of our business is and always has been now in our market segment, okay, which is people with uh, you know, just half a million dollars in investable assets to $5 million in investable assets. That's, you know, affluent, high net worth, lower end, high, upper high net worth market. So high net worth market generally. Enough money so their lives are complicated, not so much money that they don't worry every day about every problem people worry about. Um, and they're overwhelmed by complexity, information, choices, and we help them through you know, pretty inter, uh, intimate and long-term relationships. So we get, we get mm -hmm. up close to them. Okay, so the question is going to be, how, does, how do we use social media to build better, deeper relationships with our clients that, that 
help us do a better job and add more value for our clients? And I don't know what the answer to that mm -hmm. is. But there, I guarantee, uh, first of all, um, it starts with the fact that a lot of our clients want to communicate with us via social media. They can't today. I mean, other than email, right? Right. Because regulatorily unable to do that. So just being able to broaden the communication channels they have with us is going to be a plus. But what kind of content do we push out? How do we communicate with them? Um, can we create networks of, of like people, people? Yeah, like-minded people and peers with similar mm -hmm. issues? I, I don't know. That's all, that's all coming down the road. It's exciting, but I don't know what it looks like. Back to this authenticity thing and what do you project through digital channels, you said something I think would be true. If you can, if you oh, can thanks very much. <laughs> One thing that he thinks could be true. <laughs> I'm always on this side of, of comments like that. Why is you it? You live with women, you know that. I live, well, I can't say that you can. Yeah. Okay? Um, what I meant to say was one of the many things you've said this afternoon <laughs> that I found I'm particularly you true know, and compelling. Kidding. Well, shit, you embarrassed me in front of 300 people. How do you embarrass me in front of 300 people? I'm sorry. All right, kiss and make up uh -huh. right now. All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. What are the no, 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 okay, so is, if you can somehow push out, communicate the fact that you are doing what you're doing to help That's right. the people That's right. that you're communicating with, that's got the right vibe right. to it. Okay, right. now I don't know how you do it, but your story about your open forum and what you do for your small business owners, women business owners, is exactly the right thing to be doing. And it's the authenticness that goes with it. Ex because, you know, exactly. it's like, how unauthentic would it be for me to ask for the sale in that conversation? Right. Or for you to ask for the sale? It's about being relevant, whether it's wealth management, Helpful. financial services. Mm -hmm. It's helping people to break down the a mass of content and all the experts that are out there into what does it mean for me. Right. Yes. right. And we, all of us, have to stand apart in terms of this is what we represent for you. This is why we think this is good for you. Open up the gate to the conversation of why are we the people you should pick. And it's, you know, I guess, you know, it's also, it's like there's no one answer. It's an iterative right. process that eventually gets you there. And, you know, what should social media be? We don't really know, but we know that we are all going to pretty much try every option that's there. Well, and if you think about content as currency, that was the title of, of the earlier panel. It really is. You know, we, all of us, all of our firms, all of our clients are nodes on the graph now. And the way that we interact, is through content. And we, we try to add value to the different nodes. You know, you can educate people, you can entertain people, you can make them laugh, you can show them a, a great Super Bowl ad, you can, you can help teach them about long-term care. But ultimately, to, to, to be self-promotional is to be negative, right? Is to detract from that mm -hmm. network. And to add value is to have this type of content. And authenticity is, is one aspect of it. And, and I'm also wondering, I mean, there's a certain amount of patience that's required in this. Like when you talk about the sales process and what that is, mm -hmm. and having that, having the, the um, wisdom to not ask for the order in that moment is really important, I think. Well, we talked about this. My, one of my operating premises is that going forward, uh, businesses are not going to compete, can't compete, just on the basis of price, just on the basis of uh, product or service quality. You have to compete on the basis of values and ideas, and your clients, prospects, and customers are going to look at you and say, does that person's, does that firm's values, do their, does their worldview align with mine? And, and only if that's the case are you going to get to a conversation about, would you like to buy my product? Mm -hmm. And by the way, this is what it costs. So I think, um, in, in that context, whatever content you're putting out or however you do it, it needs to communicate who you are as a person and what values inform your organization. How you do that digitally, and, I, well, and, and no, so, I, so, I would, so wait a second, before you do that, <laughs> wait. Um, there is this moment where I think every organization wants to know, of course we get the whole social thing, but Clara, 
What is the ROI? How are we measuring it? We're not closing business on this. Tell us what it is, and then we'll hire you. What's the ROI of the internet? You know, it depends on the use case. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you're advertising, well, what are you advertising for? And what is the, the CLV of the person that you, you acquire as your, as your client? If it's a customer support case, if you're in sales, using LinkedIn sales solutions, I mean, it's all different. And I think what we're, what we're able to do now is not just be on social for the sake of social, but to actually, as businesses and business units, go on and say, this is my business problem. You know, cold calling doesn't work anymore, so I need to call Dan Swift's team, and I need them to help me um, get all of my sales reps so that they're, they're doing warm selling. That's the future. Or if my, my, my TV ads aren't working anymore, and I need to continue my evolution from offline to online, and everyone knows that sponsored updates are what works because you can target exactly the profile of person that you're reaching, then that's, that's the ROI calculation that you can do. Hmm. Uh, we're gonna open it up to questions. I, I promise I have, I have one last question for each panelist. So Audrey, um, the pace of change in the last three years, hmm. just in the last three years for social, what has that meant for your organization? What does that mean for Amex? It means a lot of trial and error. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you have to be willing to make mistakes. You got, yeah, you gotta step out there. You gotta know that not all of it's gonna work. We mm -hmm. were probably in a world of much more certainty before. Um, I think you also have to be open to the fact that you know your organization has to change and be very flexible. Um, you have uh, to invest in things that you don't know are certain. Um, John, here's your last, this is such a layup question for you, you ready? <laughs> oh. um, so you always talk about restoring ethics mm -hmm. to the financial service industry. So how do we restore ethics to an industry that fights against the fiduciary standard? Mm. Wow, I saved the last for my best. <laughs> yeah, you don't have enough time for my answer. <laughs> but there is pushback, so for those of you who don't, you know, so the idea of putting the client first and actually signing on to a much more rigorous fiduciary standard than the industry really wants, and John's been very outspoken, like, hey, we gotta win him back, so well, how do we do that? Okay, so officially, the, the um, CIFMA, representative for many of our firms, those in the brokerage and asset management industry, is on record and has been for years, five years, in favor of a fiduciary standard of care for professional investment professionals who provides personalized advice to individual investors about securities. Right. That's section 913 of the Dodd-Frank Act. We support that. We've always supported that. I testified in front of Congress in support of that. It is, its time has come. The best advisors in our industry already behave like fiduciaries. That's why everybody from Merrill Lynch to Goldman Sachs to Wells Fargo to RBC supports a fiduciary standard of care, a single uniform standard so the customers don't have to worry. Talk to an investment advisor, They're, they have to behave like a fiduciary. Mm -hmm. The issue is all about how to implement that. So it's not should that be the standard, it's how do you implement the standard, how do you operationalize it. And unfortunately, for some reason, I know more about that subject than almost anybody on the planet. So I'm happy to talk to you about it, but not now. Right. Not at the end of a long day. <laughs> With a glass in hand, over cocktails, you want to know the difference between you know, all the different approaches, that fine. But I believe that in my professional lifetime, a fiduciary standard will be the standard for our industry when it comes to dealing with individuals, and that is a long overdue, necessary, positive thing that will happen and will be one of the many baby steps we have to take to restore trust and confidence to our industry. Very nicely done. Thank Clara, you. here's a very easy last so question. So hard to go after him. I know. What is the future of marketing and advertising, just generally? You know? just what do you well. think? Just give me that in a sound bite. Gosh. Well, I, I think it's authentic as, as part of it. It's authentic. It's interactive and it's social. That's what today's customers demand. And we already see this with the convergence of paid, owned, and earned. And we see this with sponsored updates where you're taking organic, authentic content and you're just juicing it. And it's already popular. And the more popular organically it is, the more that you get from the paid sponsorship. So it's just a no brainer. We're seeing this in the rise of the salesperson and the relationship manager signing up for LinkedIn, 
again, using sales solutions to amplify in an authentic way to real people in their networks that they know. So in television land, we would say this here is your nugget, authentic, interactive, and it's social. And with that, I will leave it out to you to ask questions of our wonderful panelists. Come on, we got a plant or two out there. So there we go. There's, there's a plant. So the question is, uh, non-traditional competitors coming into the market, how do you use social to really position your value proposition? Anyone want to take that? That's you. Oh yeah, Clara. <laughs> First of all, I think that our biggest competitors are always the ones that we don't know and we don't expect. Um, that aside, I think whether you're competing against a traditional or a non-traditional competitor, the fact that people around the world spend 22 billion minutes every single day on social networking sites means that that is an inter integral part of the customer experience that all of us need to craft. And so we live, we have to live your values. You can't just have them you know, posted in, in your office. You have to live them. And living them means reflecting that in every interaction the customer has, whether they're in the branch, they're sitting down with their advisor, or they're, they're, they're connecting and reading whatever content you've shared on social media. And Howard Schultz calls social, mobile, and digital the fourth place. He always said home is the first place, work is the second place, uh, Starbucks, of course, is the third place. Obviously. And then the fourth place is social, mobile, and digital just because of the sheer amount of hours that all of us and our customers spend. Another question out there? All right, well then, how about a big round of applause for our panel? Thank you.